been a while since I made my Earth Planet boss guide. With the sequel now slated for a summer 2023 release, I've decided I want to bang out the rest of the content I wanted to make for the vanilla version of the game. That's right, I'm back to vanilla. No hell mod for these videos. If you are on the hell mod, some information will differ due to the changes made to certain bosses. Just like last time, I'll be covering these bosses and strategies against them to aid newer players. The selection of gear I use or recommend will all be obtainable from Earth. At this point in the game, you've completed the planet in your campaign. If you wanted, you could roll some adventures to get some extra gear before heading deep into ROM. I won't be covering the bosses in any particular order, but I will be talking about world bosses at the end of the video. All that in mind, let's get into it. The Shade and Shatter fight is potentially the first of two multi-boss fights you'll encounter. Not counting Ripide. I'm looking for two separate health bars on the screen. These Veer foes work in tandem with each other to take you down. Shatter is the brawler, consistently chasing you down to deal devastating melee strikes. And Shade is the ranger, providing a torrent of projectiles to pick you off when you're focusing on his companion. Combined, these two can definitely be intimidating to new players. Their arena is a box with pillars in the four corners, with stairs and smaller pillars placed on all four sides. The two walls on the side provide spawning locations for these bosses' adds, lurkers. When you deal a chunk of damage to one or both bosses, they'll go into a shield formation. This creates a bubble of radiation around them, which also launches radioactive volleys. During this phase, a number of lurkers will enter from the sides. Once the lurkers are gone, you can deal with the bosses again. The shield can be broken with enough damage, which will stagger the two and reset them back to the first phase. If one boss is defeated, the shield formation attack will no longer occur. However, the lurkers will begin to arrive in groups at regular intervals. As for notable attacks, Shatter has a charge move, which deals an incredible amount of damage and can knock you down if he has the Skullcracker modifier. He can also spin his staff around and slam it into the ground for an AoE attack. Shade can channel a large and heavy-hitting radioactive projectile. This does leave him open to attacks, but being hit by the move can definitely kill you or apply the radiation debuff. He can also slam his staff into the ground if you get too close. So how do we deal with these guys? First of all, I recommend stocking up on Heavy Water Elixir from Reggie and the Ward. Not only can it cure you should you receive the radiation debuff, it will also grant you a 30% damage reduction against every radiation-based attack in the fight. As for equipment, you have a few options. Since you'll just be arriving from Earth, I'll be limiting the equipment I use to what you can find there. This is usually how I play the fight. I start by immediately breaking line of sight with Shade. I usually hide behind one of these two pillars. Once Shatter gets close to me, I'll begin to unload on him. Keeping in mind where Shade is, I'll keep moving around the pillar or to another source of cover if need be. Once Shatter takes enough damage, he'll run to Shade to do the shield formation. Once this happens, I stay behind cover and take care of the lurkers. It's possible for one of the volleys to hit you out in the open, so hiding prevents this. In solo, there will be about four to five lurkers that spawn. Thankfully, once they're gone, they won't show up again until the next phase. What I typically do at this point is run into the bubble. If you spread your damage out evenly between the bosses, you can actually kill them without ending the phase. It's actually really easy too. And just be careful not to die from the constant radiation damage. This is why Mending Aura is a great pick for this strategy. Honestly, it's such an effective method for killing them, the only reason why you'd break the bubble would be to have a more drawn out fight. Personally, I think one boss with near constant adds is a tad bit more challenging than the two boss combo with the in-between adds. If you do end up killing just one boss, try and make it Shade. Evading Shatter and the adds together is a lot easier. Shade plus the adds complicates things. But yeah, that's all there really is to the fight. It's pretty cheesable, all things considered. Raise the Floating Dorito is up next. This boss centers around floating foes. The arena in which they fly is a sandy cave with slopes and radiation pits. These pits aren't too bad if you fall in them. They deal very little radiation damage. There's only one spot where falling in is kind of bad. The other four puddles have very easy to reach exits. Realistically, if all things go well, you really shouldn't be falling in them. But mistakes happen, and thankfully they aren't punishing when they do. Typically, the edges of the arena will be the safest to maneuver, where there are few chances to risk falling in. Back to the boss. Raze only has three real attacks. A burst of fireballs, a barrage of fireballs, and a scream. And that last one has an asterisk next to it. 
the only way the Scream can deal damage to you is if Ray's has the Skullcracker modifier. This will kill you basically instantly on Apocalypse. Even on Normal, you can be stun locked to death. If you end up rolling Ray's with Skullcracker, keep a healthy distance from it. As for the adds in this fight, Wasteland and Blight Skulls will spawn in from the radiation pools whenever Ray's screams or retreats. They are pretty easily dealt with from a distance. Blight Skulls can be baited out to explode near you to save on ammo. If you are using the shotgun, I recommend sticking to the sides of the arena. Both areas give you some cover and force the enemies to move closer to you, which will help with the shotgun's damage. Also, do not use Hotshot in this fight. Ray's has a 25% damage resistance to fire, and Hotshot converts all your damage to fire. Here's how the fight plays out. Ray's screams at the start, which summons some skulls. Deal with the skulls, then focus back on the boss. It will occasionally spit out a few embers towards you, albeit inaccurately. They don't deal a ton of damage, but they do apply burning stacks. Three burning stacks to be exact. The combined damage from the barrage and dot can whittle you down over time. You'll be constantly dodging to remove burn dots on top of avoiding skull projectiles and blasts. The Pocket Watch and Drifter set can help alleviate the stamina management aspect of this fight. Now would be a good time to mention, bring Hydra Coolant to this fight. The 30% reduction in fire damage taken will massively increase your survivability. Whenever it does shoot fire at you, you'll have access to its weak spot. The same goes for when it screams. The further away you are when Ray shoots its embers, the easier it'll be to side strafe some of the attack. This means you need to be careful in both side areas as getting hit by the attack up close is almost guaranteed, unless you can manage to weave around the pillars. In between Ember Bursts, Rays will occasionally scream to summon more skulls. After some time passes, Rays will retreat into the middle radiation puddle. From this, more skulls will spawn. Rays will soon emerge from the puddle and resume pursuit of the player. This cycle will repeat until the boss reaches half health. At this point, Rays gains access to a new attack. It will spin around and charge for a moment, before unleashing an unrelenting barrage of embers. Although this can deal a potentially substantial amount of damage if you stand in it, the attack lets you have a long window to unload your weapon into its weak spot. Just keep following the cycle and you'll eventually win. Next up is Scourge, a boss I am sure plenty of players have had difficulties with. The arena is a box with two slightly elevated sections to the left and right where the ad spawn from. The middle house is a mostly flat area with a small cave-like chunk in the corner. Scourge is pretty similar to the Hive Skull Elite enemies from the Destroyed Dungeons. He has a few different moves, an up-close radiation smash, which has a small AoE, a quick headbutt which summons a few hives, his infamous arm charge which can hit through walls, and his final move, Hive Shield. The adds in this fight are Ghasts, the distant cousins of Lurkers. Just like with Shade and Shatter, bring lots of heavy water elixir. There are plenty of chances you'll become irradiated here. Hives, or bees, or whatever you want to call them, home into a player after spawning. They aren't really fast, but they aren't slow either. As long as you dodge through them, or run around a corner, they won't be able to keep up with you. It's also worth mentioning that Scourge has two weaknesses, Fire and his head. His head takes 25% more damage than the rest of his body. However, attacks on his head summon a hive for every shot made on it. This is a trade-off, as though it can speed up the fight if you primarily aim for there. The homing hive spawn from it can definitely throw you off, especially if you're fighting him up close. Combined with the adds which constantly track you down, you'll need to decide when the best time to aim for his head will be. So here's how the fight goes. Engage with Scourge. Figure out where the guests are coming from. Either take them out or have them trail you. When you are a certain distance away from ghasts, they'll sprint towards you. Once they're within a few meters of you, they'll walk instead. This behavior lets you kite them around the arena while fighting Scourge, albeit at a bit of a distance. Do be careful if they get close, as they have a lunge move which can deal a great amount of damage. If you kill them up close, be sure to roll away before they explode. Either after the adds are dead, or if you are kiting them, keep dealing damage to Scourge. After you've dealt about a bar of damage to him, he'll begin to do his Hive Shield move. In this move, he can't be hurt by most attacks, and he'll summon a swarm of Hives to chase down the player. These deal a good bit of radiation damage, and can even pick off the Ghasts if they bump into him. Evade the swarm, and retaliate as soon as possible. I prefer to run around the edges of the arena while cutting the adds, getting pot shots in when I can. Bringing a few ammo boxes is definitely recommended, as you'll spend lots of munitions on the adds and scourge in your attempts. Just keep moving around the arena and chipping away at him. Eventually you'll win. 
If you end up fighting him up close, I recommend bringing Hunter's Mark to show where the adds spawn from when you inevitably kill them. It's also possible for them to die to Scourge's attacks, so be aware of that. Maul is a boss that can be completely avoided if you sneak around the edges of the arena, but we're here to fight bosses, not ignore them. His arena is a big and uneven box. There are a few crevices and side compartments. The middle is a mess of sand, junk, and pillars. The adds for this fight are the regular dogs and stinkhounds. Maul himself has a few moves, some nips, a few bites, and his main move, the charge attack. This fight is relatively simple, similar to Raze's. Maul will hunt down the player along with the other dogs. Half the time, as long as you aren't too close to Maul, he'll circle around the player or howl. When he howls, more dogs will spawn. Hunter's Mark can help locate the newly spawned ones. Every so often, Maul will perform his charge attack. This has an easily distinguishable audio cue that it's coming. Once you dodge it, you'll have plenty of time to unload your gun onto him. When he drops below half health though, he can whip around and charge a second time before stopping. This still catches me off guard to this day. This move can pretty easily one-shot you in Apocalypse unless you're running some serious defense. Other than that, this fight is pretty straightforward. Deal damage to Maul, when the adds come, deal with them, evade his charge move, rinse repeat. Also, like in the race fight, the Pocket Watch and Drifter set work wonders for easing the stamina battle you'll be having in the early game. Thankfully, he doesn't have a whole lot of health, at least without the Hardy modifier. Do be careful if he has the Skullcracker or Vicious modifier. Both of those will make this fight much more dangerous. As for a tip for making it through the fight, stay near the edges of the arena. I had good success with keeping the extra dogs at bay when I was against one of the walls. Seed Color can also be a lifesaver in this fight. Not only will they beat the hell out of Maul, but they can also hunt down any of the new dogs that spawn. I also just wanted an excuse to run the Twisted set for one of these builds. Next up is Ancient Construct. This guy is technically a boss, but he goes down really easily. The arena is the front of Wood Shop. It's pretty small, but it has a bit of cover. Ancient Construct himself has a few moves, most of which are from the normal Veer enemies. His new move is the ability to summon the adds of this fight, those being Iron Sentinels. They are honestly the worst part of the fight. They're not tanky, they're just tiny and don't have a weak spot. Combined with their bursts of hitscan attacks, they can easily drop you on Apocalypse. The easiest, albeit potentially risky, way of cheesing him is to hug one of his sides. Doing so will cause him to try and rotate towards the player. Not sure how well this would work in multiplayer, but in single player, it works pretty well. If you get too close to his front, he'll attack. And if he summons the turrets, take them out immediately. Seed Color also works pretty well for keeping damage on the boss while you deal with the adds. I'm including Very Good Boy here, even though it's technically a ROM mod. Be honest, you pat the dog. We know you did. Everyone knows you did. And if you're an emotionless husk that didn't pat the dog, perish. In all seriousness, this fight is actually pretty easy. Even Rattleweed can help distract the boss for a few seconds while you wipe up the ads. Utilize the bits of cover in the arena and you'll do fine. The first up of the world bosses, we have Clavager. This alien looking guy can be a decent challenge for new players. An attribute of both world bosses is that neither of them have weak spots. This means you'll have to be dealing raw GPS. The arena is a very small, circular pad with four short pillars. These pillars have health and can block attacks from the boss and adds. However, on higher difficulties, these pillars break incredibly quickly, so attempt to dodge what you can before resorting to hiding behind them. Clavager has a few moves, but only two ways of directly dealing damage to the player. But before we get into attacks, let's go over the shield around him. At the start of the fight, and two more times during it, he'll have two shield generators on pillars near him. They don't have much health, but they are a little distance away. It goes without saying, the regular shotgun is going to have some troubles here unless you hug the edges of the arena, which you can fall off of by the way. For this fight, just stick with one of the other long gun options. While you're dealing with these shield generators, he will attempt to blast you with a large projectile. They are fairly easy to dodge, and if you're far enough away, you may be able to sidestep some of them. You could use the pillars to protect you during this period if you wish. Once you break his shield, you can hurt him. The shield break staggers him for a few seconds, so use this opportunity to reload your weapons or heal. You'll want to, because he'll immediately summon some anointed. On solo, he spawns two to three of them every time he does the move. You'll want to deal with them as soon as possible. Anointed deal great damage per shot, and can easily pick you off as you try to avoid Clavager's attacks. Although depending on which kill you want to get, you may want to leave one alive, at least when he gets close to one and a half bars missing. Once this happens, you'll be suspended in the air as he rotates the arena beneath you. 
9 times out of 10, this rotating part doesn't do anything. Once you're dropped, you'll need to take out both shield generators again. A trick you can do to negate the falling animation is to melee attack as soon as you hit the ground. This saves you from getting up and lets you prepare for whatever move he does next, which will most likely be more ads. Now I mentioned saving at least one ad for this part. That is because the alternate kill for Claviger involves having him absorb one of his anointed during the fight. When he slams to levitate you, he'll absorb any ads in the field. He does heal from this, so be aware. It's not a very big amount, but it's worth noting. The normal kill would be preventing him from absorbing any anointed. Anointed, while dangerous, especially in groups, can be dispatched a bit easier if you know how they work. Anointed spawn with their weapons not drawn. This means as soon as you see them spawn, you can unload your weapon into them before they have a chance to attack. At least for one of them. The other 1-2 to two adds will more than likely already have their weapons readied by the time you take down the first one. Thankfully, if you deal enough damage to them in a short period, you'll stagger them. When an anointed staggers, they will lower their weapon. This forces them to replay the animation of drawing their staff, giving you ample opportunity to finish them off. From this point, you'll need to maximize your awareness in the fight. You'll need to dodge both the adds and bosses attacks. Both moves Claverger can do here have upsides and downsides while fighting the anointed. The upsides to both is that they can deal damage and kill them. The projectiles are slow and easy to dodge, but they may be out of sync with the anointed's fire. The B move is constant and very slow, making it easy to keep track of, but it can obscure incoming projectiles from the anointed. When possible, lining up an anointed with the boss's attacks is preferable, as long as it doesn't put you at great risk of dying. Once you take up the adds, rinse and repeat. I didn't mention it earlier, but having a heavy water elixir to reduce the damage from his beam attack is highly recommended. That and ammo boxes. Hotshot on either the typewriter or assault rifle work really well here for draining his health. Flicker Cloak can help mitigate some of the anointed attacks. If you manage to snag Beckoner Iron Sentinels along the way, those can help too. The Haro is the second world boss you may encounter on your way to the Undying King. This monstrosity can be really challenging for newcomers. The arena is one of the most complex and layered designs you'll ever maneuver in this game. There are two floors. The main floor consists of an outer ring and an interior cube. The ring goes around the cube and ends with a drop-off to a descending staircase close to the entrance. Along here are some pipes that explode in radiation damage when attacked. These can damage the Haro and the adds, which is nice. However, they will more than likely be killing you half the time. Once a pipe is destroyed, it'll leave behind a cloud of radiation. This is similar to the ones left behind by Blight Skulls and Ghasts. There are also a few staircases leading down to the basement. The central cube consists of a raised platform in the middle, two of four blocked doorways, and some vault locations that lead into the basement. This is a good but risky place to fight the Haro, which I will cover shortly. The basement consists of some hallways, another blocked off doorway, some elevator shafts, and a weird central room. Now you may be asking, should I be going all over the place when fighting him? And the answer depends. Most of the time, I personally never even touch the basement floor. If you want a close-knit fight, stay in the top floor middle cube. If you want a slightly less close fight, use the outer ring. If you want to be in a maze of scary hallways, go to the basement floor. Let's go over what the Haro can do and then talk about strategy. The Haro is a melee combatant through and through. His moves consist of a double slash, a potential string of single slashes, a backward slash, a flailing run, a one-shot grab move, and running away to spawn adds. Conceptually, he is actually a really simple to learn fight, assuming you are one-on-one, -on -one. and on your first attempt at beating him, it probably won't be. If you fight in the top floor middle room and keep close, 9 times out of 10 he won't run away. This is one of the most raw fights, as you are constantly at risk of being instantly killed on higher difficulties. It's worth mentioning this now, as it's important to know when fighting the Haro. Due to an oversight, the Haro's claw attacks are not tagged as being melee. This means that sources of melee damage reduction, like Mental of Thorns, will not help you in this fight. You'll need general damage reduction from sources like the Scrapper Set to help reduce the damage he deals. And do be careful on these stairs here too. Occasionally, you may try to dodge roll up them only to perform a vaulting animation and die because of it. It doesn't happen a lot, but it happens enough to make it worth mentioning. I'd only recommend fighting him here if you're extremely confident in your abilities. In the case he does run away here, or if you're fighting him in the halls and you deal enough damage to him, he'll scurry into the ceiling and summon the adds of the fight. Lurkers and ghasts. And not just a few, more like a mini horde of them. 
they'll come from the elevator shafts and swarm you if not dealt with. Rattleweed can be a nice tool for gathering a good chunk of them. Spore Shot from Spore Bloom is also a really good choice. As I previously covered in my shotguns video, you can use both charges to lock down a corner of the hallway fairly easily. If you are in the center room on the first floor, you can vault into the basement if the number of adds becomes overwhelming. Eventually, the Haro will re-enter the arena. Be careful maneuvering around, as he could be around a corner or coming up or down one of these staircases. So why do I recommend fighting him in the halls? Well, it comes down to movement. The halls let you funnel the Haro around the arena as you deal damage to him. He will eventually get close enough to swing at you, but thankfully, the length of the halls will let you keep safely rolling back out of the way. Do be careful of the pipes though. When he slashes through them, the blast emitted can easily kill you. They deal radiation damage, so you best bring some heavy water elixir. Once the Haro gets to around half health, he'll gain access to an insta-kill grab move. It's more of an impaled move, I guess. Either way, you'll die instantly if it hits you. It's insanely telegraphed though. You'll know when it's coming. Unless you're distracted by some straggling ads. The idea is to loop around the ring to the drop-off point and then repeat the process. If the radiation leaks become too much for you to maneuver through, you can head downstairs. Just be careful about where you go. One of the paths is blocked by a breakable door. Breakable for the Haro, of course. If the Haro swings towards this door, or either of the two upstairs, they will be broken for the rest of the fight. And then there's like a dead area spot here that you really don't want to be caught in. So that covers moving around the arena. How do we go about getting the alternate kill? Well, you may have noticed the spear sticking out of his back. We gotta pull that out. To go about doing that, we need to stagger the Haro. And not just once, you need to stagger him multiple times without letting him run away. As you would imagine, this is most easily achievable when fighting him in the top floor center room. You just need to keep shooting at his legs. Try to have as little downtime for damaging him as possible. Burst weapons like the shotguns work fairly well. Once you've managed to stagger him a few times, he'll drop to his knees. Quickly run up behind him and mash your interact button. Now, finish him off. And be sure not to die, as you'll need to repeat the process if you do. And that's the Haro's fight. It's honestly one of the best fights in my opinion. The thrill of finally beating this horrifying monstrosity for the first time was immensely rewarding. As for one last bit of information, be careful using explosives around the pipes. You probably won't have any sources of it by this point, but overloaded explosions can have their blast retained in the area of a burst pipe. And when you walk back into it after, you can imagine what a constantly existing hurt box does to a player. Last, but certainly not least, is Ezlin, the Undying King. While he is optional in the campaign, you should fight him eventually. In the campaign, he is scaled much higher than the player will be the first time they reach him. The player is encouraged to head to Corsus instead of fighting Ezlin. I recommend heading through Corsus and dealing with Exilus first. Hand the heart to the Queen, and then head back. Now being slightly more equipped, you can fight him. I'm still only using Earth equipment here for the sake of consistency. The arena is more of the same from Rum. A box with pillars and spots on the sides to spawn adds. The adds in this fight are anointed and lurkers. Ezlin has two different forms, melee form and summon form. When in summon form, he has two moves, summon orbs and summon adds. Eventually, he'll swap to melee form. Here he has a few attacks, a three-hit combo, a leap, and a slam attack. When you start the fight, I recommend hopping to the side of the staircase. This puts you at an angle where the anointed won't be able to shoot you, but you can still see their heads. Pick them off and then focus back on Ezlin. He will summon both of his orbs and adds back to back here. Deal with the orbs immediately. They fire projectiles that deal heavy damage on higher difficulties. Thankfully, they have a very small health pool. Once the orbs are gone, deal with the anointed. Thankfully, we know how to deal with them from our segment with Clavager. Once all of the adds are dealt with, you can focus back on Ezlin, who at this point is probably in melee form. He will pursue you viciously in this form. When he jumps, Wait until he is right in front of you, and then dodge. Keep evading his moves and landing shots on his head. Eventually he will re-enter summon form. As soon as this happens, get behind one of the pillars. Deal with the orbs, deal with the adds, repeat until he reaches half health. At this point, the boss will head up to his starting position to heal up. During this period, lurkers will begin to swarm you. If you have Rattleweed, now would be a great time to use it. Using Spore Shot on the staircase also works well, as the adds need to climb it to reach you. Eventually, the adds will stop spawning. Now would be a good time to restock on health and ammo. When you're ready, unload onto his weak spot. After some damage, he'll stagger out of the healing animation and go back into summon form. 
When this happens, I recommend hopping down on the side again and chipping away at him. Eventually he will drop, but not before getting back up again. Repeat what you've been doing, and you will have successfully defeated Ezlin, the Undying King. It can be a challenging fight, especially if you're underleveled. With enough practice, you'll get it done. Well, that was quite the endeavor. I think I know why I only did one of these videos last year. The script for this video alone is already on page 22. Nonetheless, I will still cover the other planets. I'm going to try and cover them all before Remnant 2 releases. The next planet is going to be Corsus, but if another video that isn't a world boss guide comes up before then, it was probably because I wanted to do something more entertaining. That's it for now though, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one.